Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on this Saturday morning. And, um, well, you know, you think of long-running shows. So let's, let's think of a couple. We've got The Fantastics, of course, which ran for a couple of decades, then went away for a few months, and then came back. So they're, they're sort of the champions of some sort, and Phantom of the Opera in London and in New York, and, and some other shows that are climbing up there, like Lion King. But when you list that pantheon of shows, or like The Mousetrap in England as well, shows that have just been there, and been there, and been there, and had that certain bit of luck and magic and just right place, right timeness, you have to include a show by Warren Manzi, and it's not a big, large-scale musical, and it doesn't have any stars per se, although we will be talking to the star of the show, who became a star through the show, which is just my long way of saying that Perfect Crime has played more than 10,000 performances off-Broadway since it first began. Um, my gosh, when was it? April 18th, 1987. The show is still running. It moved around a few times. It's playing now at the Duffy Theater at uh, 1553 Broadway. But someone who has been there through nearly every single one of its current 10,230-something performances is Catherine Russell. She was with the show from the beginning, and she is still with it. And now she is with us on the phone from New York. Catherine Russell, hello, good morning. How you doing? I'm good, but I have to correct you, actually. Uh-oh. Okay. We left the Duffy Theater seven years ago at 46th Street and Broadway because of the building that we were in that housed the Howard Johnsons and the fabulous Gaiety Male Burlesque. Yes. And the Duffy Theater, where yes. Perfect Crime played, was sold for a whopping $110 million. Wow. So we moved. We moved four blocks north to the Snapple Theater Center. Oh, you are in Snapple. Broadway. Okay, yeah. right. I'm very, very sorry. And, you know, I would have gotten, me of all people, you know, who who's helps put out Performing Arts Insider, I should have gotten that right. But I was uh, Googling. Oh, not at all. But it's, it's yeah. just funny because uh, I have very fond memories of the Duffy Theater. It's now an American Eagle store with an enormous digital sign that sort of towers over Times Square. Oh, wonderful, I guess. No, no yeah. but the thing is... Because uh, when you go Googling for Perfect Crime and looking for your websites, you're still listed in some places as being at the sure, Duffy Theater. Sure. So it's that's why I was like, whoa, you know, I thought that was sounded a little odd. But no, they're at the Snapple Center, which is, right. I guess, where the, the Fantastics is running, too. You're in the same place, right? Absolutely. I'm, I'm one of the producers of the Fantastics, so I'm very proud of it. Wait, how did you get to be a producer of oh, uh, the new version, not when Lori Noto was Oh, yes, started. no, no, of the new version, of the revival, right. Nice, and you are a producer currently, I assume, of Perfect Crime. No, I am not. No, I am not a producer of Perfect Crime. The executive producer is a man named Armand Hyatt. He's a Massachusetts-based attorney, and he has very proudly been the producer of the show for 25 years. I am simply the actress in the show, and I also, because um, Armand lives in Massachusetts, I'm the general manager of the show. So. Oh, so you kind of look after, because cause I'm wondering, oh my About God, you, business, yeah. you, you could be fired at one point with two weeks' notice, like any equity actors. <laughs> I could be fired. I, 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 you know, make sure I say my lines, and I <laughs> show up to work, and I do all the things I'm supposed to do. <laughs> now, speaking of showing up to work, now, I was not kidding when I said, or, or maybe I got, I've gotten everything else about the show wrong so far, so maybe I got Oh, that was the only thing you had wrong, and, and you're right, the, interne- it's, it, the Internet is at fault, which is why I correct people so they know. So, let's, let's though, say that, what is it, 10,233 as of the 25th anniversary of the show. Mm-hmm. Out of those, you, let's see, minus four, you have been in 10,220. Of them at right. that point. Right. I mean. We've estimated it's like up two and a half years of my life actually have been spent on stage saying those lines and shooting people and getting slapped and kissed and all that, which is, I guess, a lot of time. Now, what I. Oh, first, I mean, even people on Broadway will take a week or two weeks off vacation. Have you never had a vacation in the past 25 years? No, I haven't been on a plane since before 9 11. I understand now they, they check you for security. <laughs> You have to take your shoes off now. Did you know that? <laughs> and you can only bring a little bit of liquid on, apparently. Seriously, I haven't been on a plane in, like, I think, 16 years or something. Oh, Long time. 
good lord. Well, I mean, you have the, the cool thing is, on some level, you haven't had to audition. And you haven't had to act or, or pick up work because you've got a full-time, really cool, I mean, the best job in the world. You're acting. I've been able to do, th- I still audition, and I've been able to do some work, certainly around Perfect Crime, but I feel enormously blessed that I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do when I was a little girl. I go to the theater every night and get on stage and act, which is enormously satisfying and pleasurable to me. But so I'm, I'm quite happy. I'm sure the question that, that a lot of listeners are asking are, okay, okay, you're, you're incredibly dedicated and diligent and you haven't taken the vacation and you work 52, obviously, 52 week, weeks a year, um, eight shows a week. The question is, like, have you had strep throat? Have you had a broken, I mean, you know, no, what, I'm when very have healthy. You, I mean, yeah. my personal theory is that when you do work that you like, you tend to stay healthier. That's one thing. And I also find that, I mean, I show up, I, I'm, I'm a college professor, I show up to work, I don't call in sick for that. I I think years ago I was a waitress, I didn't call in sick. I, I've never really been a person who calls in sick. Moreover, if I feel a little bad when I wake up in the morning, I generally feel better once I go to work. There's something about getting up and going to work that makes most people feel better, I think. Uh, but, but the circumstances. Yeah. If I had a broken leg, I'd supposed to be on my crutches dragging my leg to work. But I like going to work. I, I yeah. It fills me up, it gives me pleasure, and it certainly makes me feel better, and so I haven't been um, seriously ill in 25 years. Not, not wood, not wood. You know? No, I, I mean, I tell this story fairly frequently that one of a guest I interviewed a couple of years ago is the singer Maud Maggart. I asked her about you know how she keeps in shape and her vocal stuff, and she said there's something called doctor theater, and it is true. Is that you can you could have a terrible cold in the morning, and you're dealing with it, and you're drinking the tea and the theraflu and whatever it is, but you, 15 minutes when you're backstage behind that curtain, doctor theater takes over, and you get out there, and you may not be at your very best, but suddenly you feel at least like 50 to 75 percent better just because you're out there doing it and you have to do it right. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes when I'm really tired or I am feeling alone under the weather, the good thing is I go on stage and I'm standing there listening and reacting, and sometimes I think I give a pretty good performance because I'm just um, I'm just doing it. Do you know what I mean? I'm not acting up a storm. I'm, I'm just there listening and reacting and doing what really you're supposed to be doing when you're acting. So have, have there been they times doesn't affect the performance in any negative way if I'm feeling under the weather. Good. Was there a point at some... Like fourteen years in, you've been doing the show six, seven, eight thousand performances. Do you ever go up on your lines? You know, I don't forget my lines very often. Every once in a while, I'm sure. You know, it, it happens. Um, one of the other actors will forget a line, and we'll both look at each other. Uh, the audience has never known that we've forgotten a line. I mean, the the rule is you just keep going. So no, the lines pretty much come out of my mouth. I mean, that that that's good. So that when things happen in the theater or something like that, um, you know. We've had some bizarre experiences with people in the audience like? saying things or doing things. Um, uh, you know, the lines keep coming, even if you get a little distracted. Right, now, now, now that's, you just brought up another question that I always ask long-term performers of, like, what are the weirdest, strangest things that have happened while you've been doing the show? There's been a lot, especially because it's a murder mystery and there's, you know, there are guns. Um, my character gets slapped and strangled and, you know, sort of, not horribly physically abused, but definitely... Um, I'm physically attacked, and there was one guy who sat in the front row, and he's like, yeah, slap her again, knock her down, kick her teeth out. Was, Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't come on the stage, and frankly, if he'd come on the stage, I think I could have taken him, but still, it was a little, you know, um, Wait, was that the night? <laughs> he got yeah. into the violence against, yeah. against my, my character. Was that the night O.J. Simpson visited the performance? I wonder. If <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, Klaus von Bülow did. Um, no. Yes, and in our play, uh, a character who perhaps has been murdered is a diabetic. So it's quite interesting that he came to see the play. Did he come backstage it. afterwards and say, oh, this, is, this is my story? No, no, I no, lived no. this. No, no. Carolyn Warmus came, the woman who I think killed her, was accused and I think convicted of killing her um, her lover's wife. The Munster woman, yeah. The, you know, okay, yeah, a bunch yeah. Of, we've had a bunch of famous... Um, <laughs> uh, so the infamous people come and see the show over the years. No, I mean other other actors. You know, talk to them. Says, "Oh, I remember Paul Newman came to see, and and, and Elizabeth Taylor was in the audience." And, and you're like, "Well, we had Carolyn Warhouse, <laughs> <laughs> famous criminals." Well, I think that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Joseph Joseph Mengele came on Bat Night. Was, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't know what. No, but but um, I think people uh, are attracted to the uh, the mystery aspect of the play. I think a lot of people. 
I think in our society right now, we're obsessed with crime. There are a million crime shows on TV, Law and Order, um, uh, Forensic Files, I Almost Got Away With It, Who the Bleep Did I Marry? I mean, there are all these, I think there are entire channels just dedicated to crime. So for a lot of people, a play about murder or crime is attractive. Even the title, Perfect Crime, makes people think, okay, if I'm not in the mood for a musical, this is going to be something that's going to entertain me for two hours and keep me guessing. And I think that probably that's one of the reasons that the play has had such a long run. It's a great equalizer. Yeah, but and, and the weird thing is that murder mysteries used to have a certain cool place in the theme. There was Death Trap, of course, and, and Clue. Well, not, not Clue, um, but... Well, yes, Clue, but there, and then there was another pretty famous one of twists and turns, whether it was Schaffer or whoever. But in the past 20, 30 years, murder mysteries have not done especially well at all, certainly not on Broadway, and haven't had much luck off Broadway either. So so in some ways you can say, oh, people want to see murder mystery, it's different, but they're anomalous in the fact that Rupert Holmes and a lot of other people just have had, you know, Michael Christopher, I think, wrote a, a... a thriller murder mystery or two that they just don't do well. So I do want to... And, you know, Rupert Holmes came, he did... I, I run I run the Snapple Theater Center. I actually built this. It's a theater center with, with two theaters and two studios. Hey. And he came and did a reading here, and he actually shook my hand and congratulated me on the success of Perfect Crime and said he was so happy to see that a thriller had done so well, which I thought was really lovely. He's a really lovely man. I don't know if you've ever interviewed him. No, no, I'd like to, but... but yeah, you know. really classy. Because they're bringing Drew back. Uh, next year. Yeah, yeah. well, I, they are, right? And I think that's, that's really interesting. Certain people are attracted to the thriller genre, and I think he's one of them. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. I love the mystery of Edwin Drew. I'm glad it's coming back. So so let me ask, um, as you said, you are, of course, the actress who's, who's been in it for 10,230-something times, but general manager. I'm always curious, what does a general manager do? Oh, it's actually really interesting. I didn't have any idea. The, the show, when it first opened, was a showcase, 16 performances running off-off Broadway. And when it opened in April of 1987, um, there was some... Um, Armand Hyatt, the executive producer, raised some money to move it off Broadway. And um, the people who had originally produced the showcase didn't want to continue. And so I'd done a little bit of producing or general managing. And I said, sure, I'll, you know, I'll do it. I thought maybe... God, this was May. I thought, wow, if it runs to like 4th of July, that'll be great. <laughs> and so I basically learned from a couple of really good general managers. They taught me what to do. You do the payroll. Um, you supervise the marketing and the advertising. You um, make sure that the theater is running properly. You, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's a very interesting, um, multifaceted job. I do the same thing for the Fantastics. So it's basically running all aspects of the business of the show. That's pretty amazing. It's, it's um, fun. What I like about it is that I get on stage every night at 8 o'clock, but, uh, and I use maybe the artistic side of my brain, but during the day I get to use the business side of my brain, and I think it's really interesting to use both. I think if all I did was come to the theater every night and do Perfect Crime, I would lose my mind, or, or any play. It's not, acting is wonderfully satisfying, but it's 16 hours a week. So I really like using my brain the rest of the time. And in fact, when I get on stage and my cell phone can ring for two hours and I'm doing something that I love, it's a wonderful respite. It's like a little mini vacation. <laughs> no, I, I totally, totally believe that. But yeah. one thing I wonder about Perfect Crime as opposed to say, other shows, let's say a Broadway show will be running for a few years and it'll have peaks and valleys and times, say, during the holidays when it does really well and then slogging through January and February when the tourists are in town and then trying to get to April again. All that sort of thing. Just are there peaks and valleys for Perfect Crime? Some sort Absolutely, of general and it yeah. very much mirrors. It very much mirrors the Broadway season. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of off Broadway. I love off Broadway. I believe that uh, the off Broadway commercial market is okay, but it could certainly be better. And I'm interested in. I'm trying to build some more theaters off Broadway. I, I built the Snapple Theater Center um, because I think that we need more venues um, for commercial off Broadway, especially in the Times Square area. But off Broadway sells by default. Most people, most tourists do not come to New York and say, I'm going to see an off-Broadway play. If they're going to come to New York and see theater, they want to see Lion King, they want to see Spider-Man, they want to see Wicked, they want to see Book of Mormon. The trick is getting them while they're here, for example, to see something else, like the Fantastics, like Perfect Crime. Because as, as fabulous as it is to sit in a big Broadway theater and there's nothing like it, there's also something really wonderful about sitting in a small theater and feeling like you could, you could almost touch the actors. 
And I think traditionally people thought of off Broadway as being like in basements and kind of skeedy. The Snapple Theater Center, as is New World Stages and a couple of the other new off Broadway theaters, it's new. It's got really clean bathrooms. It's corporate. It's sunny. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a nice place to be. And so it's a really good option for people who are in Times Square if they see the Broadway show to see something off Broadway or. If you're like parents with two kids, you could see the Fantastics and even get a backstage tour for 200 bucks. And that's going to buy like a ticket and a half at Lion King. Right, yeah. And so I think for a lot of people, Off-Broadway is a great alternative. Um, it's more economical. It's more intimate. And so, you know, people choose to come and see Off-Broadway shows. But absolutely, we do better when Broadway's booming. There are more people around. I got you. And, and again, it's more of an impulse buy. The, the, the nice thing about Perfect Crime and the Fantastics, which is unlike almost every other off-Broadway show, except maybe, obviously, um, oh, uh, down to Blue Man Group or maybe Fuerza Bruta, and the, the real problem for the tourists is that you can't market something at Manhattan Theater Club or because it's only going to be open for two or three months. And if, if there's a Japanese person who's planning a New York trip in nine months... You can't say, oh, my God, there's this amazing play that's down at the Vineyard or, or you know, New York Theater right. Workshop. It, won't be, it may be there, but you can't. They can't bank on that. No, you're exactly right. But they can bank on the Fantastics of Perfect Crime. Moreover, people say if they haven't heard of them, and surprisingly there are people who haven't heard of the Fantastics, which I think is strange, mm. people say, well, it's been running a long time. It must be pretty good. Well, that helped, yeah. At I a mean, point. I mean, I say yeah. to people, we're still making money or we wouldn't be running. So, yeah, people are buying tickets and coming to see it and enjoying it and telling other people they enjoy it. And that's why both shows are still running. And how much, since, again, you are the GM of all this, how much do you have to do advertising, um, promotional marketing, and also, like, the serious sort of, oh, crap, we have to take out a, a gazillion-dollar New York Times ad at you know, this point? How much budget is there? That's not anymore, yeah. even Broadway. It's very rare. You don't see, as much as I love the New York Times and, you know, it's my great pleasure to sit and read the New York Times with a cup of coffee every single morning. I don't know whether that's really the way to reach audiences anymore. And I think I, I think I'm speaking for most of the theater community. With social media right now, there are lots of other ways to reach people much more quickly and more effectively. I think word of mouth. We think we like to think outside the box in terms of the ways that we sell both the shows here. And um, yeah. I think that's more effective because, frankly, an ad, a full page ad in the New York Times costs more money than we could make in a week. <laughs> oh, no, full, I'm forgetting that. You know, it doesn't make sense. And a little tiny ad, I just don't know whether an ad the size of two postage stamps really grabs people's attention. It, do, it does. I tried it once for, uh, for Performing Arts Insider, the journal that I edit. You know, it's, it's an inside theater journal. I thought, okay, get it in the New York Times. I got one phone call. And this is, you know, it was this tiny little ad that was on sale, and it was like a couple of hundred bucks way back when. Right. And then it's like, waste. Waste. No no offense to New York Times. I love it, too. But uh, but you guys, are you in the uh, the ABC listings, which is also we, an ad? We are. Uh, we have been. We used to be in the ABCs every single day. Once again, I don't know whether that's the most effective way to spend your advertising dollars. So it depends on the time of year and on, you know, what audience for marketing to, but, um, yeah, Perfect Crime, up until 9-11, was in the ABCs every single day, and after 9-11, we stopped, and it didn't really have a noticeable effect on the box office. The same with the Fantastics. Mm. Don't know whether people necessarily go to the ABCs. They don't understand, first of all, that they, you have to pay for them, and it's about $2,000 a week. I don't know whether being in the ABCs generates $2,000 a week of advertising sales. You know, I mean, right, yeah. there are probably more effective ways to take up to two thousand dollars and spend it to reach more audience members. Especially in this day and age, and with a new, you know, new right? Especially with media, shows yeah. that are somewhat branded. If I had a new show, I would absolutely put it in the ABCs every single day with some quotes. But I don't mm. think you need to do that for long-running shows. I think it's kind of a waste of advertising dollars, which are precious to everyone. Even I am sure to the producers of Wicked. Do you know what I mean? You have <laughs> oh, to make yeah. sure that your advertising money reaches people that will buy tickets. And there's the interesting and challenging and fun thing to figure out. <laughs> um, where I love the, to do I love to do it. It's really fun. Cool. Can, can I ask, um, by the way, we're talking with Catherine Russell, who is the long-running and long-playing general manager and actress in Perfect Crime, off-Broadway at the Snapple Theater Center, right in the heart 
of Manhattan. 200 and almost 40 performances and going strong. I'm wondering, first of all, is Warren Manzi, the author of the play, we haven't really mentioned him, is he alive and well? And what oh, yes, he's alive and well. Um, he's, he had written a bunch of plays, but he's actually focusing on writing short stories now. Oh. Um, okay. So, yeah, he selects a report about, like, how long each act is running. It's <laughs> 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 about running time. And, um, yeah, he's, uh, he doesn't come to New York very often. He lives in Massachusetts. But um, he's quite involved in, in uh, the artistic aspects of the show from afar. And uh, I think he's a brilliant writer, and um, his fiction is wonderful. Oh, good. Okay, great. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to know. And, and let me ask, I've got to do this. The four performances so far that, that you have not made right. of Perfect Crime, why did you miss them? My brother and sister's weddings. I was in the wedding party. Oh, so there were two days each? Is that the... Uh, uh, my brother got married in Boston, so I had to miss three performances. Ooh. I to Boston after a Saturday matinee and made the rehearsal dinner and the wedding. And my sister got married on a Saturday, and I missed the matinee. I was going to miss the evening performance, but my understudy got sick, and I had to come back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, and you... missed both of the reception, um, because my understudy was too sick to go no, on. hold on. This is the most amazing thing in the history. <laughs> you have an understudy. You, you missed was, four performances yeah. in 25 years. Um, I, go, I haven't even. I should have taken a calculator and and figured out what point oh 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 something percentage of ten thousand three hundred thirty three four is. So you've got this on your study, who never ever 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 goes on. Well, she is also the assistant stage manager, and yeah. with all due respect, she also gets paid and she gets benefits. So um, when people when women have auditioned for the role over the years, they're very aware of the fact that I'm someone who doesn't miss. So I think that's part of the deal. Oh no! I, I'm not joking about that part. That she's not, she's she's not doing anything. And she's getting. I just think it's really, really funny that the one time it's like, right? <laughs> you, it's like, okay, you're on. And she's like, I can't. I'm sick. I know. That, that, that There's many of them. This was in 1988, very early on in the run. But it's, it's ironic that that you know, Warren was actually still in New York, and he called me and said, "You have to get back. You have to get back. She can't go on." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's it's okay. I was happy to do it. And, you know, actually, I walked down the aisle. I did what I had to do. Well, yes, yes, you did. <laughs> what are some of the other acting things? You said that over the years you have done a couple of little acting things yeah. here, here and there other than Perfect Crime. What sure. have you been? I actually did this wonderful play called Some Enchanted Evening, and the man who wrote it came to see Perfect Crime and then came back and handed me the script and said, I would love it if you would do my play. So we did it. It's about two people who meet um, through a personal ad, hmm. and we did it all over Manhattan in a lot of different theaters and some cabarets, and then um, we made it into an independent film that should get released next year. Um, oh, so this is pretty recent, I guess. Over yeah, the past, well, yeah. Um, yes, well, I've, I've done it over a, a couple of years. Um, we did. We shot the film, I guess, a year and a half ago, and it's getting edited. Um, I had a small part in a movie with Uma Thurman called Ceremony. I just did a film this year called Contracts. Um, people have been able to work around my um, performing schedule, um, so um, that's very gratifying. And people do offer me. Um, I've been offered some some really good work. Um, I'm very often. I get offered the same kind of role that I play, which is like this very strong, sort of driven, bitchy woman, and. It would be interesting to play someone who was different from that. As much as I love playing Margaret, um, I did another independent film yeah. um, called The Lifters, where I played a, a mother who works in a factory and is kind of beaten down, and her 16-year-old daughter is a shoplifter, and she comes home and yells at her daughter and slaps her around. And it was actually really fun to play someone who was beaten down by life and not educated, and it was really gratifying to stretch my acting muscles and play someone so different. So that's the kind of thing I kind of look for when I take another role. Cool, cool. We were we've been chatting with uh, Catherine Russell, who is the actress of those independent films, but of course we best know her for Perfect Crime off Broadway at the Snapple Theater Center. And, and again, congratulations on hitting the actual 25th anniversary of the show just a couple of days ago, back on Wednesday, April 18th. Right was the 25th anniversary. Was um, <clears throat> anything fun, special at the party? Any special guests? Any? Uh... We invited a lot of the people who'd worked on the show over the years, and they all stopped by and said hi. We had a lot of photographs from way back in 1987 all the way through uh, the present time. Our producer was here, and he made a speech and thanked everybody for coming. It was a really lovely evening. After the performance, we had um, a, a big party with, with, with dinner and an open bar, so lots of people... Um, stop by just to say hi and uh, to celebrate 
Um, perfect Crime is the result of a lot of people working very hard over the years. It was truly a collaborative effort, and so it was nice to see so many people who had been part of that and gave me an opportunity to say thank you. So it was a lovely night. And so, you know, I, the other thing I forgot to mention to everybody from the uh, press materials on the show is that over the years, you yourself have, on stage, thank goodness, shot 89 different men. You've kissed 57 other men on stage, uh, fired off over 83,000 bullets, and uh, you, you've had more than 5,000 prop coffee cakes. I, I assume they are real coffee cakes. Cause it's real coffee it's cake, it's a clue. Um, but look at this way. What a life I have. I get to be kissed by handsome men. I get to shoot them. <laughs> I mean, what a great life. I get to be slapped and kissed and, and, and shoot people, you know, eight times a week. Sounds like you're you on the again. I know no? we're again, but no, no, no. But, um, no but the interesting other thing that, that is part of the press release that I find uh, really kind of cool is, you know, back in 1987, the world was a little different. So you've, I guess, Warren Manzi, the playwright, had to update the play a little bit. Um, why, why don't you tell us how that has been necessary? Right. Well, there were no cell phones in 1987. Um, uh, my character is supposed to be uh, uh, about to be interviewed on TV by, first it was Phil Donahue, then it was Oprah Winfrey, and now we just say the morning shows because that is no longer one person who's so powerful that right. interviewed on his or her show would make you a famous author. Um, we have a flat screen TV instead of a small color TV. Um, we have, have made some references to, to DNA. There are obviously... Um, DNA and forensics right. has been developed much more fully than it was in 1987. So the playwright has has you know tinkered with things a little bit. Oh, and my character's husband is supposed to have a lot of money. I think it started out at ten million dollars, it went to fifty, and now someone asks me how much money he has, and I have to say six hundred million. Oh, so that it's funny that fifty million dollars isn't considered a lot of money anymore. No, <laughs> she has a comment like that. It is family owns England, and and so. $15 million, $50 million, you, you co can't own England for $50 million, sadly. So it's now $600 million that he has. So the amount of money is, uh, has, has increased a great deal. <laughs> Actually, I think you can get a solid piece of New Jersey for $50 mil. You still can. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe not the garden part. But yeah. anyway, I... I Assiduously try to, you know, keep it updated so people don't feel like they're seeing some dusty old show, but rather something very living and breathing. And hopefully that's what people feel when they come. That's what they say anyway. Well, um, people, everybody, come to the Snapple Theater Center. It's at 210 West 50th Street. See, I found the right address now. 210 West 50th Street. Uh, literally, I guess, between Times Square and 8th Avenue would be where that is. Um, and see... Perfect Crime. Tickets are from Ticketmaster at 212-307-4100, 212-307-4100. And if you go to see Perfect Crime, be it this coming week or a month from now or five years from now, there's a point nine or 99.99999% chance that you will see the lead actress, Catherine Russell, still there, still doing the role and still keeping Perfect Crime going. I think it's, I think it's marvelous. I think it's really a, a great New York thing that you guys have going. Thank you, Dave. I'm a big fan of yours, so thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's just been delightful. Thank you so much.